These three, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next three weeks, only we're going to do them in a little bit different order. It seemed to make sense since next week is the closest Sunday to Valentine's Day. It seemed appropriate to talk about love on that. And then uh, the next week, we're going to hear from our mission team from, uh, that went to Guatemala back in November, and that seemed like a good Sunday to fit with hope. So today, we want to talk about faith. Now, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. And I would argue that love and hope are not possible without faith. But likewise, love and faith are hard to attain without any hope. And finally, hope and faith are definitely an impossibility without love. These three, faith, hope, and love, they're intricately intertwined, aren't they? They're just all wrapped up together, kind of like that thrice-bound cord that, that uh, we read about in the Bible that's not easily broken. Faith, hope, and love are just intricately intertwined. The author of Hebrews defines faith as confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. Now, as Christians, we say that we believe God is love, right? And that they will know we are Christians by our what? That was, you were great, Steve, but everybody else. They know we are Christians by our? Very good audience participation, positive feedback. And we claim that our hope is in what? Our hope is in Jesus Christ because there lies the promise of our salvation and the gift of eternal life. And our faith is rooted in this belief that it is by the grace of God that we are saved. It's not something that we earn. There's, there's nothing you can do to attain it. It is a gift that is bestowed upon you. Grace, undeserved, unmerited favor. So for us, the question, if we have faith, is, is what do we actually believe? In what or in whom do we place our faith? Jesus claimed what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And access to the Father is only available through me. It's what Jesus claimed. And therefore, as a Christ follower, as a Christian, our faith should be in Jesus Christ. That's why we recited the Apostles' Creed this morning. It talks about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Coincidentally, whenever we recite the Apostles' Creed, and it says Catholic Church, you'll notice it is a lowercase c, which means universal church. That's the word for universal. So um, if that troubled some of you lifelong Methodists, I just want to clear that up for you whenever we recite the Apostles' Creed. So I hope, as a pastor, I hope that you know what you believe and why you believe it. And that, that your deeply held religious convictions, that they undergird, that they support, that they are the foundation for the very fabric of your life. And I also hope that, that your faith is exhibited by how you live out your daily lives. I hope it's not something you just do on Sunday morning. Our faith teaches what? Our faith teaches that God created, we go back to Genesis, right? God created a perfect world. And sin distorted that perfect creation. And then God created humanity in the image of God. And then our sin, we believe, distorts that perfect image that is imprinted upon each one of us. We believe that God is holy and perfect, right? Holy and perfect. And that Sin cannot enter into the presence of such holiness. So, connecting the dots here, since we are imperfect and unholy, we've got a problem. How do we enter into the presence of a holy and perfect God? Something or someone must bridge that gap, right? 
Something or someone must rectify this problem. We call that atoning for our sin or redeeming us, right? Doing for someone what they are not capable of doing for themselves that can restore that image, that perfect image of God in us so that we can enter into the presence of God. John 3.16, right? God loved humanity so much that the solution to that problem was always the Son. Always the Son. And that through belief in the Son, you will receive eternal life. You can enter into the presence of the Holy God. Jesus Christ, we believe, paid for our sin. Right? Atoned for. Made restitution for our sin through his death on a cross. That's what we believe, right? And then restored our life through what? We said it in the Apostles' Creed. Through the resurrection. Conquering death. Making life everlasting possible. This is the basis for our faith, right? This is what we believe. Peter puts it this way in his first epistle. He says, you know, it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but it was revealed these last times in these last times for your sake through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so your faith and hope are in God our faith also teaches that after Jesus Christ ascended that was taken up to the father that the church Believers everywhere, the church was given the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's presence with us and in us. And we believe the Holy Spirit is what? It's God's presence in this world. And it is God's power in this world. And we believe that the Holy Spirit resides in the hearts and minds of God's people, right? So how can we prove that all of this is true? Scientific and theological evidence, documents, they support these truths to a certain point. They support these truths to a certain point. It is at that point that you have to take a leap. There has to be, you have to make a leap. And your belief in God, your belief in Jesus Christ, at that point, has to be accepted on faith. Belief in what you've hoped for. Certain of what you cannot see. That leap is sometimes harder for others. Maybe than it is for you. The prophets, they called God a wind. The Hebrew word is ruah. Sounds much more elegant than wind, doesn't it? Ruah, a rushing and mysterious wind. You can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. And you certainly cannot capture the wind, can you? Go outside, put your arms around it, squeeze real tight, hold on to the wind. Even though you can't see it, smell it, taste it, touch it, grab it, and hold on to it. You believe and have faith that the wind is real, right? Why? Because you have seen evidence of the power of the wind. Especially here in the Midwest where we have tornadoes, right? You have seen the power of the wind. But because you can't see it, smell it, taste it, or hold on to it, would you say, prove it, it's not real? No. Let me give you another example of what you believe in and have faith in, but can't explain. Because some people say, I'm not going to believe in anything I can't explain. And I'm going to say hogwash. <laughs> How many people have flown on an airplane? Just audience participation. 
Of you, keep your hands up. How many of you all would be aeronautical engineers? Keep your hand up if you're an aeronautical engineer. Yeah, we've got a couple engineers, but not too many aeronautical engineers, right? I can't tell you all of the physics that goes into getting a plane off of the ground with one person in it, let alone several hundred on a large commercial jetliner made of steel. But I know <laughs> that I can get on a plane and fly across the great pond. I can't explain it to you. But every time I get in a plane, I have faith that I will take off here and I will land there. You can't see God. You can't taste God. You can't smell God. And you cannot hold on to God with your hands. But as a believer, we believe in God, right? We have faith that there is a God. And what is the evidence of that faith? You are the evidence of that faith. Your testimony, your story about God's presence in your life and the transformation that has taken place in your life. You passed from death to life. And that is is the evidence of God. You are. So how deep is your faith? What is the depth of your faith? I would challenge that your faith is perhaps only as deep as the circumstances in which it has been tested and challenged. I mean, how do you know what you actually believe until you are forced to put those beliefs into action? Now, some of you know exactly what I am talking about because your life has been littered with opportunities to exercise your faith, right? Now, others of you are saying, I don't know that I go along with that statement because, you know, I have great faith, but I don't know that it's ever really been challenged or tested. So I'll go a different route. Your faith is only as strong or deep as your actions communicate. Your faith is only as strong or as deep as your actions communicate, which is what James was, in, was, was talking about whenever he wrote, faith without deeds is dead. You have faith? Great. Even the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Don't pat yourself on the back just because you believe. I'll communicate the depth of my faith through my deeds. Just like a body without the Spirit is dead, so too is faith without deeds. So if your faith does not motivate you to act, then according to James, you have no faith. Wow, that's kind of harsh. Because wait a minute, wait a minute. Whenever I read Paul, those of you who have read Paul, Paul says what? It is by grace that you are saved through faith and nothing you can do to earn it. It's a gift from God, right? So are the two contradicting each other? Which was the argument in the early church. James and Paul disagree. No, they don't. Because James never says that your deeds will save you. He never says that you're saved by works, that our salvation is earned by what you do. But rather what James is saying is the evidence of your faith is expressed through your actions. So in other words, your deeds, your works, your actions are your testimony of your faith. Your actions are proof that your life has been transformed. Now, according to James, if your actions are a contradiction of the faith that you claim to have, then James would question, has transformation actually occurred? Because 
we believe faith in Jesus Christ is transformational. Now, sometimes the evidence of that transformation happens instantaneously. And many of us have a story or know of a story that faith in Jesus Christ was a 180. I was this way, I met Jesus Christ, I, I accepted it on faith, I received my salvation, and I went a totally different direction. And, and my life is completely different than the way it was before. And others of us, others, we have this story of transformation taking place over a long period of time. We're creatures of comparison, right? My story's not that interesting. It doesn't speak of the power of God because it didn't happen just like that. Sometimes it takes us a lifetime to let go of our sin. For God to call us out of our sin. I think that's what Paul meant whenever he said, you work out your salvation daily. Not that you're earning your salvation. But God is working it out in your life. Take up your cross daily. You know, the, the battle with what we call in church speak, the battle of the flesh. Our sinful desires, our selfish desires. That battle takes place daily, doesn't it? Choosing the ways of God over what we want many times. It's a daily battle. So James says, no transformation, no faith. Evangelist pastor Tony Campolo tells this story of Ducktown. It's a town that's made up entirely of ducks. There's a duck shopkeeper and a duck mayor, and they all live in their little duck houses. And on Sunday mornings, they all waddle out of their duck houses down Main Street and waddle into their church. They waddle in and they sit down and nestle down in their selected pews. By the way, they all sit in exactly the same spot every Sunday. None of them sit on the front row, or not very many of them. Okay, anyway, so they all waddle in, they sit, and then in waddles the duck choir. Quack, quack, quack. I'm quacking you up at this point, aren't I? Anyway, sorry, I couldn't resist. But anyway, in waddles the duck choir, and then up to the pulpit waddles the duck pastor, where the duck pastor opens the duck Bible. And he reads to them. He says, ducks, God has given you wings. It is with wings that you can fly. With wings you can mount up and you ducks can soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences can hold you. You have wings. The sky is the limit with the wings that God has given you. And you can fly like birds. And all the ducks shout. It must have been a Pentecostal church. Because all the ducks shouted, Amen! We can fly! At the end of the closing duck hymn, after the duck pastor gives the duck benediction, they all waddle out of their pew. Waddle home. Are you still waddling when you were made to fly? How can you strengthen your faith? I believe it with my mind. We'll say amen to it, Pastor Duck. But I can't get there in my heart. How do I put it into action? It's a daily struggle. But you have to start somewhere to strengthen your faith. And as your pastor, I want you to have faith that moves mountains. 
I want you to have a faith in Jesus Christ that transforms your life. That you can become more than you ever thought you could. That you can live into this plan that God has for your life. That you can fly instead of waddle. How do you do that? Some practical things that you can do. It's not just a heart issue. Pray without ceasing. Communication, conversation with God. Reach Bible. We're told that it is the sword that the Holy Spirit uses. That it is how God is poured into you. It is through the power of the living Word of God. Come to worship. We need to be in community. It is hard to do life on your own. It's hard to waddle through life on your own. So we need a community. We need to invest in other people and serve and welcome and invite. If this is something that builds you up, that you take comfort in, this church family, you should want that for other people. And you should also serve other people. And the last thing practically you can do is be generous. Not just with your money. It's not just about money. I'm talking about your time, your love, your care, your encouragement. Build up, not tear down. I got news for you. We live in a world where most people want to see other people fail. They would rather sit back and hope that it doesn't work out for the good so that they can say, I told you so. See, I was right. Then encourage someone else and help them succeed. So invest in other people. Be generous with your time and your talent and be generous with your treasure. Not just giving to the church. There's other organizations that do great work in our community and in our region that need your financial support. There are families that need groceries. There are families that need to be invited to a nice big meal at your home. There are people that need clothes and you've got a pile in your basement that you could... I mean, the list goes on and on and on. All of that strengthens your faith so that when the struggle comes knocking on your door, and it will, we're told that God's grace is enough, right? That your faith will sustain you. We're not promised that, there is no promise here, all right? You're not signing up for smooth sailing. There is, I, nowhere do I read that it says that now all of your illnesses are going to be fixed, all of your ailments, you're not going to have any financial worries, there's not going to be any divorce in the church, there won't be any severed relations. I don't read that anywhere. But God promises that His presence will be with you. His presence will be with you. One more story and then I'll be quiet. In the 1800s, there was a, uh, a famous um, daredevil by the name of Charles Blondin. And some of you all may have heard this story. He was a tightrope walker. Not the kind in the, the, the canopy at the circus. He was a tightrope walker. And he stretched a tightrope over a quarter of a mile over Niagara Falls in 1860. And Charles Blondin walked across Niagara Falls on the tightrope. And then he went back. And then he grabbed a sack of potatoes. And he even rumored to have taken a stove and cooked an omelet out in the middle of the falls. And people at this point on both the American and the Canadian side are standing up and going, wow, every feat was better than the last. They were cheering, they were yelling, they were screaming, and the crowd was huge, and they were just, oh, they were in awe that he could walk back and forth over Niagara Falls. 
And then he got a wheelbarrow. And he put a sack of potatoes in the wheelbarrow. And he said, do you all believe that I can cross the falls pushing this wheelbarrow with this sack of potatoes? And everybody screamed, yes, we believe. We believe you can do it, Charles. And they watched as he crossed the falls to the other side pushing the wheelbarrow and they said do you believe that I can cross the falls pushing a person in the wheelbarrow and they said we believe we believe yes you can do it and then he offered well who wants to get in the wheelbarrow We're invited not to just stand on our perch in safety and watch as other people do amazing feats of faith. We're invited to get in the wheelbarrow and risk failure. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. But your love is expressed by how you live out your faith. Go and live out your faith. Amen.